Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to tackle a really polarizing topic, and that's the topic of personas um, and how I use personas in my specific design practice when I'm working either on projects for myself or for my clients. But a little bit more about myself and these videos. So I am Sarah Duty, in case we haven't met yet, and I'm a user experience designer and entrepreneur from New York City. Um, these episodes are filled with honest answers and insights to your questions about business technology and design. Now, if you would like to learn more about user experience, you can get my weekly UX notebook or newsletter at theuxnotebook.com. And if you have a question for me, I'll tell you how to submit that at the end of this video. Um, but first, let's go to a question from one of our readers. So Denise from Germany asked me, um, how do I use personas in my design practice and what do you, in capital letters, um, need to know? So Denise, good question. Personas are one of those topics that, like I said in the beginning, are very polarizing. I find that people either love them or hate them. And the reason that I think personas have a bad rap is that a lot of times they are done from the perspective of marketing personas. And by that, I mean a focus on demographics and not psychographics. And by that, I mean the personas that serve us as user experience designers best have to be rooted not just in people's stats, like their income and number of children and all those things that we traditionally think of when we think of kind of the profile of someone, but the personas that serve us best are the ones that are rooted in more psychographic information. What does that mean? That means things like, what are people's behaviors? What are their attitudes? What are their goals? What are their needs? What are their habits? What is the holistic view of their life? Not just these kind of bullet lists of stats that we know about them. We don't just want to know the what, we want to know the why behind what they do and who they are. And so that's, first of all, why I think personas are polarizing because a lot of people think personas are just those marketing type information. The great personas that serve us need to be rooted in the more holistic 360 view of a person. Um, and unfortunately, we see a lot of those marketing style personas in UX because that's what people are just used to when it comes to personas. But those don't serve us well in the design process because when we need to make a key decision, we like to refer to those personas to help kind of just jog our memory and remind us, okay, who are we making this for? What is their problem? What are their attitudes toward this? What are their needs, etc.? And we can use the persona as almost a gut check. But when your persona is just a sheet of paper that says, Susie is a soccer mom and she earns $70,000 combined household income and has two kids and um, is the school PTA president. That doesn't tell us much. We can't make decisions really off of that. So that's why we need these more behavioral personas. Um, so first of all, personas, super, super polarizing. Now, um, sorry, I just had to adjust my screen because it went like to sleep. Anyway, um, so how do I use personas in my design practice? So let me tell you, first of all, honestly, it varies from project to project. So if a founder or a company that's already in market is coming to me and they want me to work on their product, there's tons of factors that go into this. And let me tell you that within about five minutes of talking to someone, I know whether or not they know their customer or not. And that helps me decide how much I'm going to bake in personas to the overall project. If it becomes evident that the person does not know their customer um, and is that relying too much on what they think, not what they have gone out and heard from real people. If I find that out, I'm gonna bake in some research into that project, not so I can make more money, so that I can save the client from 
themselves. And so that I'm setting them up to win in the future to make smarter decisions. So if I know within five minutes that the client is making assumptions and isn't acting off of a true knowledge of the customer, then I'll try and sell them on research so that they can have a better grasp of their customer and make better decisions in the long term. Um, but I'm always careful to explain to people um, that this is not just about creating a little PDF of personas because the moment you tell people that, they get really nervous and they just see dollar signs and they think, oh, they just wanna create these pretty little personas and spend all this time in Sketch or Illustrator making this document for me that I'm never gonna look at. And your job as a designer is to educate them what real personas are about in UX and how it will serve them throughout the whole product development cycle and also save them a lot of time and money because it's going to become a tool. The personas will become a tool to help the team stay focused and not get stuck in the weeds. Because in that meeting, when they are debating features and saying, I think it should be this way, my cousin thinks it should be that way, and that article told me this, it's great to have that information, but what you want is you want to be making decisions based on who your customers are, and you've done that through research, and that's really the heart of personas when it comes to UX. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it personas, avatars, ideal customer, your lifer, whoever, you know, whatever word works for you, I don't care. But I just kind of feel bad for personas because they have this really bad reputation. But the whole point is to educate you and your team about your customers so you can have a really strong understanding with them and use it as, like I said, a gut check or an anchor when you need to make those hard decisions and you can say, okay, let's hit pause, let's stop fighting about this feature and let's go back to our customer profile and ask ourselves, does this feature map back to their needs, their goals, their behaviors? How will this feature serve person X? And if it won't, then don't build it. So that's how kind of I I guess at a high level, approach personas and talk about personas and let clients know when they need personas and the value of them. Um, it's not about just adding another line item to my project and being able to say, oh, let's sell this client personas. No, because you know what? I'd rather um, be able to convince the client or stakeholder they need personas because you know what? It's gonna make my job a lot easier as well because I won't have to then debate the client or the stakeholder and remind them and fight for these features because if we're all operating from this same um, perspective of the customer, of our ideal customer profile, then it's going to make a lot of my design decisions very obvious. So that's what I do for personas when it comes to my own business. Now, I guess a few tips I could give you concerning personas. Um, I would say you should never make a persona unless you've based it off of actual research. You shouldn't just make a persona based off of what you think because that is not helping you step into the shoes of your customer. It's just taking your assumptions in your brain and putting them into a pretty persona. And that's just going to be based on way too many assumptions. So don't do that. If you create a persona that has not been rooted in what you've heard from actual people, then you're doing it wrong. Um, some other tips for personas, I would say definitely try and humanize them. And what do I mean by that? I would say you want to use real photos of people, whether it's stock photography or pictures you take of actual people you interview. Um, I would say you want to give them names. So what do I mean by that? I would say you want to um, give them a name and then give them a descriptor. And this could sound really cheesy to some people, but I say it because honestly, it works. So let's say we were designing a site or product for young people who are um, starting out early in their careers, maybe right after college, let's say it's women, and we're creating a product to help them kind of navigate those first five years in their career. So we've gone off and done some research, and now we've seen these buckets of people 
that we want to address. So maybe we have the dreamer and this is the person who knows they want to do something in a certain industry maybe, but they don't know exactly what to do. And so they are checking out a lot of different options and pursuing the dream, but they don't know the exact steps they need to get there. So this is the dreamer. In this case, I create a persona talking about their needs, behaviors, wants, habits, other sites they use, etc. this holistic view of them. And then I give that person a name. And again, it could sound cheesy, it works. I've seen it work on Teams, so that's why I say um, this is a good idea. Um, I use alliteration, so I use a name and a descriptor. So maybe it's Denise the Dreamer. Sounds totally cheesy, but I swear in those meetings, when you're in a conflict, I was gonna say fighting, but hopefully you don't fight. When you're in a conflict with your team, you can then, instead of making it about you and the other person you're having the discussion with, you can bring that persona or ideal customer into the conversation and you can say, okay, let's take a step back. What would Denise, the dreamer, need out of this feature? How does this solve her problem? And just by having Denise and dreamer, that will help with recall. And what do I mean by that? A lot of times, Teams create personas and then they get stuck in a PDF on Dropbox or something and then that's a giant waste of money. Personas are no good unless your team embodies them and um, evangelizes them. And so this strategy of using alliteration to do Denise the Dreamer or um, I can't think of another one right now, but you get it. Um, that helps your team not just remember these ideal customers, but the qualities that each customer had. Because you've word, used a trigger word like Denise the dreamer, that word dreamer is gonna help with recall of everything else that kind of is foundational to that person, that customer, or that character, if you will. Um, so that's a really great tip I could give you. Um, I do it, I've seen other teams do it. I've done it with teams myself. Sounds cheesy, but it works. So that's how I kind of use personas either um, with my clients um, and helping them realize it's not just about this document that's gonna sit on a file somewhere. It's really about having this living, breathing, understanding of who your customers are so that in the heat of the moment, you can go back to these people, use them as a gut check, invite them into your decision and figure out did this feature map back to this person's problem and needs? If not, don't build it. Um, so that's it for today. I hope that answers your question. And if you have a question for me, I'd love to answer it. Um, you can go to saraduty.com slash contact. We'll also link to that in the comments below. And you can submit your question there. We have quite a queue of questions, but we'll get to it very soon. Now, I would love to hear from you about your experience with personas. So has your team done personas before? Do they believe in them? Do they hate them? Do they love them? What's worked, what hasn't worked? I'd love to hear any of your questions or comments or experiences with using personas in the comments below. So leave a comment. I'm gonna be checking in um, later today um, to see your responses and in the meantime, if you want to learn more about user experience, you can get my weekly UX newsletter, theuxnotebook.com. And that's it for today. Thanks for stopping by, and I will catch you in another episode. Take care.